Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Drawing Together. My name's Scott Meyer. This is Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, because we meet every day, every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, to draw together. So this is what we're working on today. Uh, my buddy Britton here uh, posed for, uh, for this great photograph. So we're going to work on this portrait of him. Um, you can find that, uh, that image, the one that's right below me, you can find a link to it in the description there. So if you're new, you're going to want to know that this show is all about us drawing together. So we meet every week to challenge ourselves in a, in a particular way because we're trying to get better at drawing and just simply take some time to focus on developing that skill. So um, Britton, if you're watching, hello. I don't know if you're, he, he, I think he's, he might be back upstairs, hopefully. If not, um, you can watch the recording. So if you are watching um, and, and you want to watch later and draw along, you can do so. This will go up as a recording later. So um, everybody say hello to Britain. <laughs> so, um, all right. Today, I, I, I'm excited to, to, to try this one out today because we're actually going to be talking a lot about tools and cheating, right? We've kind of talked a bit about it before, and I, I, I've taken some time this week to think through um, how to really manage those, those issues. You know, at, at what point um, does a tool uh, kind of hinder our growth, and when does it benefit it? So um, I'm going to kind of get into that. Let me, um, all right, so let me talk through the materials I'm working with today. So uh, before I do that, um, the the materials we're working with uh, i've got a cotton rag paper i believe this is the coventry rag by legion paper uh, i'll be working in graphite today i've got a range i i like the softer graphites um, so what do i have here i have the i have a b an 8b and a 12b so that's going going to go pretty dark today um, i do need a paper towel so i've got one of those here um, that'll help to kind of smooth things out i've got um, my trusty blending stump. This is a well-used, well-loved one. I have a my uh, rubber eraser that I have kind of shar uh, shaved down into this chisel tip to give some fine detail, and I have this um, my kneaded eraser. So pretty standard materials for drawing with graphite, but you can use whatever materials you'd like. Um, and so, yeah, please feel free to challenge yourself using different materials. Um, and I think this is going to translate to whatever material you're going to be working with. So um, if you do have any questions, I have everything brought up here on the left. I can see the chat. And so feel free to shout out with any questions. I don't know if you can hear Tybalt right outside the door, but he really wants to come in today. <laughs> um, his, one of his toys kind of snuck in under the door. So that's what he's freaking out about. Um, but uh, so... Um, yeah, so let's, I, I wanted to, again, to kind of talk about some tools that are available to you. Um, and the, 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 the way I'm thinking about it and what I want to kind of talk about, and I'd love to get your, your ideas on, is that there, there's so many tools that we can use to capture a likeness, to create our drawings, right? And so the, the tools we've been using so far throughout the show have been pretty standard. We're using uh, angle sighting, comparative measuring, um, we're blurring our vision. We're using a lot of standard tools for observational drawing. And those are developed um, out of a desire to build our skills with observational drawing. So when we're out in the field, we're confronted by a real life object, we can use those skills to translate that three dimensional object onto two dimensions on the paper. Um, but there are so many ways that you can you can kind of achieve a likeness as well. You can, you know, if we're working from a photograph like we are today, you know, some of you choose to grid a, a photo reference and then you transfer that grid onto your surface. You might use tracing paper. I think I've demonstrated that once last year, you know, the ability to, you can kind of print out a reference image, you can cover it with graphite on the back, put it on your drawing and then transfer it on by tracing over your image. Um, but today I want to use uh, some optical devices here. Um, and, and the reason I want to do that is I really want to get the likeness right. right? Um, and I can go through all of those tools that we've used before. And you've seen me struggle with, with portraits before. And many of you have helped me through capturing the proportions. But sometimes you just don't want to mess around with it. <laughs> you just want to kind of correct it. And, and what I found by using some of these tools is that it can be a really helpful way to identify natural biases that I have, uh, things that I tend to repeat over and over and over again in a drawing. So it helps me to see where I might be off. So 
the, the tool that actually I want to recommend that, that I've been using, I used it a bit on some of the, the projects in the book I was working with, um, and, and I, I'm going to try to simulate it here, but if I bring this over here, what I have is I have my phone. Um, this is the DaVinci Eye app. And I actually, this is one of their arms that they have. And if they're, if they're watching, I don't know if they're going to happen to be on today, but if you are, welcome. Um, so this is the DaVinci Eye app, and it's a cool app that um, uses your phone's camera, and it will overlay a, uh, or the reference image on your screen. So when you're looking through the screen, you're seeing through the camera as well as a transparent layer of the reference image. Um, and they built in a bunch of really cool tools that are really designed for artists. And, and a lot of the things that we've talked about on the show um, that I, I kind of want to talk through. Uh, now, I, it's difficult for me to use this uh, in this specific application with a live stream, but I'll be able to simulate it so you know exactly how I use it. Um, but I wanted to show you this because um, what it does is if you can see in the screen here, um, when I bring my, my pencil underneath, the camera is displaying the paper underneath and it's got the reference image on top and I can see both and I can control the opacity of that reference image so I can see the drawing as well as as the reference um, and with this arm it's stable I can just bring it in and out uh, kind of bring it back up into position um, to to reorient myself uh, then there's also some really other cool tools like it's got this breakdown feature which if you look at the reference here um, it breaks down the different values similar to like a no tan in some places where you're just identifying shapes of value and we talk about that blurring our vision to eliminate the details and try to see simple shapes of value. So, so much of what we do when we're drawing is to try to override that, that desire to see detail clearly and instead see things as abstract shapes and then build a likeness out of that. So this feature here does that. So now some of these tools can be really helpful to kind of help get you into those, those spaces. If you're having a hard time seeing those shapes of value, if you're getting a hard time or having a hard time with correct proportion, some of these tools can be really helpful. Um, now, I'm actually, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swing this out um, so it's out of the way here and I'm gonna turn on the transparency here. So what I've done is basically simulated that. So when I'm, when I'm using the, that app and I'm using my phone, this is essentially what I see. It's just a little bit easier because I don't have the, the phone in the, in the way right now. Um, now, the, what I, I guess what I want to get to before I start to draw is that I want to be clear in my mind about what I'm achieving by using this app. All right. And so, uh, because I find it really useful in certain, certain applications um, and in certain ways to help me build a skill. I'm always wanting to look to improve my skills. And, and I think when you have a tool and you're looking for opportunities to grow and improve, that's when the tool becomes most useful. When it becomes a crutch and you stop relying on your own development and instead you're using, um, using these tools, it gets, it's easy to kind of get into a rhythm. Because what, what can happen sometimes is if we're not aware of these devices as tools, we lose the opportunity to kind of push them forward and advance our own skills. You know, sometimes you can make some really cool art by using a tool incorrectly, right? And, and so, um, you know, you can play around with like distortions or things like that. Um, you, can, you can learn so much by making a lot of mistakes. And so that's what I kind of want to throw that out there is that this doesn't limit us from learning and growing. It just becomes another tool that might allow us to discover new things about our own way of working and perhaps new ways of making marks. So um, that's a long introduction today, <laughs> and I'll probably keep talking through it. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you're thinking about wanting to get started. This is going to be a, a, a tricky one. It's a great pose. Uh, Britton did a great job um, really looking at the light and, and being a great model here so that um, we have a nice um, balance between light and darks and a good sense of structure there. And so um, there's a lot of comments coming through. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything um, because I, I do have them up over here. So um, let's see. All right. Welcome, everybody. Yeah, so if you get a chance, check out that app. It's really cool. And I didn't really cover all the features at all. There's so many cool features on it that I'm still exploring as well. But um, all right. So for this project, you've seen me struggle with portraits. So today I've decided, you know, I'm not going to mess around 
with the proportions. I'm just going to go for it and instead shift my focus on other aspects of the drawing. So I have it kind of projected on the paper here and with a basically a 50% transparency I can get a sense of the outlines. Um, now one of the things we talk about a lot in this um, in this show is the is the relationship between shape and line, contour line. And I'll, I'll be building a bit more with line than I normally do, um, but I also want to um, I also want to keep in mind that we're working on shapes. And so you can see that I'm I'm still making a mess on the page. There's a bit of a delay between my drawing and the camera that's capturing the overhead shot here, but I'm still thinking about it in terms of a gesture looking back and forth between the reference and the and the paper right here in front of me. And, and as I'm doing this, I'm trying to keep my, my mind in the same headspace as if I didn't have this tool available to me. Uh, because uh, I, I, there, there's, there is something in the language to drawing that, it, that I want to um, continue on here. So I'm thinking about it, you know, as I'm, as I'm making these gestures, actually I want to try to figure out where the, the central axis to his head is. You can see that I'm just kind of establishing the basic shape, kind of going for it. It's fairly quick and loose and I'm making some uh, kind of adjustments as I go, but I, I need to also keep in mind that there is, um, you know, there's a very, you know, what I'm going to be doing is, is I'm just going to keep adjusting this as I go. I don't want to create something that is rigid and strict. Uh, instead, I'm, uh, I'm adhering to my general process of blocking in, what do I have here? Oh, I have the 12B. I, I don't want the 12B. I wasn't paying attention. I got so excited about drawing that I just grabbed whatever pencil. And, um, so I just I want to continue um, using the this, the mindset that I have when I'm not using a tool like this, um, so that there is kind of a continuity, there's a freshness to the drawing. And and part of what it can be helpful is um, is kind of being clear on your objectives when you're going into the into a drawing. You know, are you are you looking for something for something that directly matches the reference photo? Um, are you looking for the the reference photo to be simply that, just a reference, a kind of a jumping off point? Uh, are you um, looking to, to kind of be more expressive with the work? And now, in this case, like I said, I I really want to make sure I get those proportions right, and this helps me kind of kind of short cut that whole process a little bit. I can get into a little bit more. And I can also see by, you know, by keeping with that gestural mark, I can kind of start to see where, um, again, some of my natural biases might come in. We've talked about it before, is that it, it can be really helpful to pay attention to where you're making kind of um, inaccurate observations consistently. I don't want to say mistakes, they're just inaccurate observations. Um, and the if you find that you're making that same decision repeatedly, it can be something that you can then target specifically with, a, with exercises to help kind of overcome that. It also becomes part of your signature. Uh, we've talked about that before here where, you know, the, one of the ways um, artwork can be authenticated is by looking for those areas in the work um, where corrections have been made or adjustments have been made. Um, that are consistent with what that artist does um, regularly. You know that I, you know I, I, I tend to, um, you know, elongate the head, for example, or I might get the ang the angle of the eyes are off, and then I have to kind of adjust. You know, so my uh, those initial observations tend to be off in a, in a particular way. So. Um, All right, just checking. Uh, oh, I see some people have used that app as well. Again, it's the DaVinci Eye app. Um, LA for Dreams. Just got the Cezanne graphite pencils. Yeah, that's what I'm working with today, so I'm glad you got those. I really enjoy them. 
really nice and smooth. Um, but if you do have any questions, feel free to shout out. Or if you have any kind of particular ideas about you know, working from uh, reference images, I know some artists project images and then and use it in a similar way as this. This is an interesting way of projecting that image um, that just uses kind of modern technology in a, in a great way. Um, uh, you know, some prefer to grid. What I, the, the preference that I have for this over a grid is that this encourages me to, um, to find continuity in the lines. When I start with a grid, my natural inclination is to then start from a place of the image being fractured, and then, I, my, then the struggle is to try to unify everything. Um, and this way, I can, I can focus on the, the fluidity of the marks um, I can focus on kind of the, 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 um, the structure overall. But let me, uh, let, me, let me remove that transparency so you can see, see where the drawing is. So that's what the drawing looks like now. It's a little bit harder to see with the reference image. Um, so now I can evaluate, is it placed properly on the page? Is it, um, it going to fit effectively? Is there a pleasing balance between lights and darks? And that's when I when I use the that app again. I have this arm, so I can just bring it in and out, um, and kind of check. I can move it away, and uh, keep keep going. And so this allows me to kind of control when that tool is being used. And you may decide for yourself that you want to use it exclusively and build the entire drawing that way. Or you, you may say, I just needed to establish some basic points from which we'll develop the drawing. But now I, I want to evaluate the work purely on a balance of, of shape. Is it, is it a pleasing arrangement of shapes? Is it compositionally, is it arranged nicely? Am I blocking in values effectively here? Like, am I thinking about a, li a dark to light, dark to light sequence that's effective? Um, Oh, and then yeah, Adele saying she uses a window. Yeah, light box. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a, that's a great one. Um, and I, I want to. What I what I forgot to do is, bring the reference image up for me. So I only had the small one. I need a I need a larger one to work from here. So, um, uh, Greg saying you prefer the grid as well. Um, All right. Um, all right, Aaron. I appreciate the comments there, and Greg, thanks for sharing your thoughts. Yeah, it's it's a really tricky thing, and I it's a, we've we've even we brought it up here in this this show before. Um, you know, answering questions about you know is it cheating to grid or trace, and and it's been I feel like a little bit challenging to articulate. So I thought this was a great opportunity. To just show it, and, and again, uh, for me, what it comes down to is, is whatever, whatever you need to keep you drawing, go with it, right? And so, if you hit this wall where you're like, I'm just not progressing, and I'm not finding it very satisfying, use whatever tools you need to to get back into drawing. <laughs> so that's where you're gonna, that's where your skills are gonna really start to improve is the more you draw, um, and. The, like again, like I said, using this this tool, this option of having the transparency for you, if I bring that back, um, it just it helps me to again kind of see where I might be off more regularly. Um, so what I'm going to do right now, though, is I'm going to kind of give myself some key markers. So this intersection here, the neck and the earlobe, is kind of a a key one for me, and I'm going to. Establish the angle of the ears, and, um, and so I'm not. Again, I'm not doing really anything fundamentally different with the mark making here than I normally do. So again, I'm breaking the, I'm breaking the curves into straight angles. Uh, instead of using angle sighting like I've been in the past, now I'm just using this transparency. Um, and then, yeah, oh, and I see some, 
Um, yeah, it's really cool. I haven't been able to keep up with all the comments about how you use it, so I'm excited to kind of go back through and read them. Um, but one of the other thoughts that I have about that as well is that for people who are interested in painting specifically, but if you find yourself being inhibited by your drawing skills, um, one way to kind of get into that is through some of these tools, uh, you know, with using transparencies like this, tracing, um, gridding, all of those things can kind of help to help to shortcut that. So you can kind of get into and start experimenting with, with color and some of the other things that can make painting so enjoyable. Um, and like I said, what I'm kind of excited to do is play around with tools like this and manipulate them, right? And, and, um, and see where some, some sort of new image making might come out of it. You know, what would happen if I, if I change the angles and distortions and play around with the transparencies uh, in, in interesting ways. Like I said, so much great art comes as a result of people using tools kind of not as they're intended, not necessarily incorrectly, but you know, if you, um, if you open yourself up to finding kind of creative ways to use a tool, then, then uh, it can be kind of fun. Uh, and then, you know, I think about two artists like Vermeer, there's a lot of, um, a lot of suggestion out there that Vermeer would have used optical devices. Uh, as well as, you know, other artists. And so, you know, we've got their camera lucidas out there, things like that, that are kind of, can be fun to use. I've never had much luck using them. Um, but again, this is, if it, you know, if it's, uh, if it's a tool, you know, you can, you'll find your own way through it. All right, so what I'm doing now is I'm giving myself some suggestion around the nose. Uh, again, I'm kind of finding key points here. So like this corner of the eye, angle of the, the cheek, Uh, now, for me, one of the things that I love about drawing is that it has the ability to, to show its evolution. All right? We get a sense through the mark making that the, you know, the, the artist making those marks is thinking and processing information and executing on the page. All that stuff that's, that's being processed in the head, right? And so the, one of the unique opportunities we have with drawing is to kind of see that process unfold on the page. And so I don't want to get rid of all the um, kind of sketch marks, all those initial marks, um, uh, because again, that just, it kind of shows its past a bit. Uh, and th that's what's unique about drawing for, from my perspective. Um, and so I'm kind of intentionally leaving some of these marks on here and I don't want to make it super clean but part of that is just how I'm feeling today. Um, and, and so again, I kind of encourage you all to think about what type of experience you want to have in your mark making. Um, not just, you know, what image do you want to make, but as you make those marks, how, how do you want your body to kind of move? How, what kind of, do you want it to be tight and controlled? Do you want it to be loose and expressive? Do you want to be a combination of the two? Do you want to be thinking fast? Do you want to be thinking slow? All of those things, um, that creates the whole drawing experience. Um, and if we, if we kind of ignore that part and instead just focus on the image, I feel like we're missing out on some unique opportunities there. So I'm, as I'm going through here, I'm, my, I'm shifting to thinking about um, some of the, again, the main shapes um, and thinking about um, kind of jumping across the form is what I'm trying to do here. So we, we've talked about it here. Try not to get fixated on one spot um, too much, especially early on. Um, be uh, we're trying to we're trying to create a, a unified whole here, and the danger in um, in me using this reference photo, and this is what I, I'm saying a danger for myself, just because I know how I work, 
is that I'm fighting that very strong urge right now to just rely purely on the reference photo and kind of dig into every little detail and maybe do the eye, move over to this eye, and then down to the nose and kind of finish as I go. So I'm fighting that urge right now and instead focusing on building up that solid foundation. Um, so adhering to the kind of the same principles that we've been talking about for the last several weeks of building everything up and being in control of where the uh, where the refinement happens. And so actually I'm gonna I'm gonna undo, I'm gonna take that away, come back to this, and just focus on mark making and drawing. And I feel like I have I may have enough here, enough information to go with. Again, if I was using the app, I would just be bringing this in, kind of aligning it. Actually, let me do that. And you can see it. Uh, you, my drawing is a little bit off, out of alignment from this phone here. But I just, again, I want to kind of show you how that might actually work. Um, you know, kind of move it in and out. And, and I imagine that for those of you who already use an app like this, um, you're going to have your own path with that, your, you know, your own way of, of utilizing that app, which is really cool. Um, that's where I get, get, get really excited about tools like this because um, I get excited to see how people might use them differently. So now I'm, I'm still using the side of the pencil like I, I normally do to kind of build up broad areas of tone. I'm using the B, so it's a little bit lighter, a little bit harder, but I'm using the side because I don't want to create embossed lines that are, that are too strong to, that I'll have difficulty managing it later. Um, LA for Dreams has a question. How do I gain more self-confidence? I, I often allow self doubt to stop me from creating an image. Ooh, I would I'd be interested in see what other people have to say. Um, Let's see, I'm seeing if anybody, um, yeah, I'm seeing just a lot of cool comments about different, like, uh, I, who is it that uses the Lucy? Uh, Sally uses the Lucy, that's really awesome, that, that camera Lucida device. Um, again, I've, I've, had, I, I've, I've had less success using that, that's why I kind of, I prefer this app, but um, again, whatever get, keeps you drawing. And LA for Dreams, I'm not forgetting about your, your question, I'm trying to articulate it. Trying to think about my thoughts. So, uh, what I'm doing now is just I'm taking the, the the pad of my hand and I'm just kind of wiping it down. Um, so, for those of you that that know the way I work, um, what I'm doing there is I'm unifying it, right? So I've got I'm laying down all these marks. There's a lot of marks showing, and by kind of wiping things down, I'm kind of creating more unification between everything, and then I'm going to kind of create more contrast, I'm going to refine things more, and we're constantly searching for the balance between variety and unity, adding marks and then unifying it until we find that ultimate balance. So right now, I'm kind of shifting my gears, thinking about it abstractly, while I'm also trying to process LA for Dreams questions about self-confidence. Um, uh, Jackie, try to remember it's only a piece of paper. <laughs> That's a great one, yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's it's a tricky one. Um, it, we, um, you know, I guess there's a part of it. It becomes comes down to the motivation, right? And when I've certainly experienced many times of self doubt in my work, um, and I'm trying to think about what, what helped me through it. Um, I, I do think Jackie is, is right there. There's something to the idea that it's only a piece of paper, right? And I think when, when you allow yourself freedom to make mistakes and maybe reframe your ideas about what sec success means, um, then it can be helpful. And that's the 12B. I don't want the 12B. I'm going to shift up to the 8B. So this is, this is a really dark pencil, but I know I can go even darker. I'm going to use the side of the pencil and um, continue to build up kind of tones, just broad areas of tone. Um, but I, I, kind of getting back to that thought is before, or are you, while you're not working, kind of contemplate, you know, what, 
what are your goals? Um, because sometimes, especially with making art, we don't necessarily have a specific goal in mind. We just have that urge to create. And then that goal just becomes to get that out. But then when we're, we're done, we compare ourselves to others and we say, well, mine doesn't quite look like that. Or um, you know, maybe there was something that was less satisfying. Um, but if you, if you kind of, if you, there's a big difference between saying, like, if I do 100 drawings and I can get one done that I'm happy with, that's a success, versus saying, I have to get this one drawing right or I'm a failure, right? Those are so wildly different ways of approaching it. But um, for me, I felt it was really helpful when I had an instructor said, kind of lay out that percentage and just say, hey, if you can get one out of 100, that's, that's a win, right? And then that, that allows me to do you know, one bad drawing after another to get to the good ones. Because the truth is, is you're only going to get better um, through making you know, uh, kind of inaccurate drawings, essentially, or you know, drawings that you're less happy with. That's the only way you're going to do it. Um, so, you you once you know that you have to you have to make mistakes, uh, then it's just a matter of categorizing the drawing that you're doing and say, well, that's not that's not the win. That's just that just is one of the 99 that I need to go go through to get to that one. Um, and then as you as you get to that, then you start to get um, your, your, your hit rate starts to improve where you might you know, hit one out of 50 and then one out of 25, et cetera. And then you start to get into a rhythm and then you run into the opposite where you might get into a rut where you're just doing the same drawing over and over again and it's a great drawing, but you're not advancing anymore because you're not challenging yourself. You're not opening yourself up. And then you might then challenge yourself to say, I'm going to make 100 bad drawings again, right? It, just so that I can we're kind of re-engage with that part of me that needs to um, needs to improve and discover something new about my art making. So, um, and that's part of why we we meet here in the show is it's all about um, it's all about just drawing. It's not this isn't about making the best drawing possible. This is about just drawing, realizing that it does something to the mind. At least for me, it, it, um, it's a way of focus, form of focus that I can't really achieve through other ways because that's just where, the way my brain works. All right, so um, bringing that transparency back up because as you can see, one thing that's missing in my drawing so far are the eyes. So, um, and I, that was a calculated decision because um, I don't want to get sucked in I am I'm, I am trying to be aware of <laughs> the the unhelpful aspects of my nature, uh, which is to if I, I know that if I get those eyes in there, uh, I'm going to want to um, I want to get every little detail in there, and I don't want to do that now. I know that it's only brought me pain and suffering <laughs> when I've done that in the past. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm kind of locating the the inside of this uh, eye. And then that back corner, just taking it slow, kind of darting around, kind of moving around the, the eye. So I'm trying not to, to draw it as a singular form, and I'll, I'll remove that transparency in a little bit. And, and at this stage, we've talked about this a lot, but as much as you can, try to observe these as just abstract shapes. There's that eye right in the eyelash up there. Um, and, and try not to be thinking about drawing an eye, drawing a nose, etc. These are just shapes. They're values. We're not getting those values 100% right. We're just thinking about where they're located. So when we think about the, the, the drawing process, this is, this is following along the same drawing process as I typically do. Um, it's just instead of using comparative measuring Instead of using angle sighting, I'm using this transparency, starting with a gesture and then gradually refining it. So you're moving from a gesture, correcting the proportions and focusing on proportions, continuing to focus and adjust those proportions as you refine, and then you become selective about where you refine, um, where you, you bring greater sharpness into your drawing. 
And, and again, we, we talk about detail as kind of something different. Detail is something you, play, you apply to the drawing. And instead, we're thinking about just ref continually refining the forms. You know, there are some amazing drawings out there. If you look at Seurat's drawing, for example, his, you know, very little kind of refinement in, in terms of detail, some big shapes, refining. Instead, his refinement comes about getting that main shape correct and getting those values right, getting that sense of light. So if you get a chance to check out Seurat's drawing, it's amazing. Um, and then, again, I, kind of latching on to your own your own desires for the drawing experience. Do you, do you want to have that satisfaction of, of getting every little detail? Do you want to be loose, expressive? You're going to be somewhere in between, um, and you'll, you'll find your own, your own way through it. Uh, so now, let's see. So now I've kind of placed the eyes roughly. I think the light here on his... Um, you know, light here on the space is really nice, and one of the things that really stood out to me in this pose is, let me get rid of the transparency now, is just the, the graceful quality of this edge here. So that's going to be kind of, think, a strong focal point for me today. Um, all right, LA for Dreams, like the one out of a hundred, yeah. And it, it's, it's hard. It's hard to be kind to yourself. We've talked about that. Um, in past episodes, you know what what I've uh, what I've gone through in terms of that confidence is, you know, situations where you know I've always felt like the artist, right? It's just where I was naturally drawn to, and I I suspect that a vast majority of you watching right here are the same, right? You've identified I'm the I'm the kind of artist. So you have that something inherent in you that wants to uh, make images or find creative solutions to things. They just, they're, there's something in there that you define. And, and when that became so much of my identity, the danger in that is that if, you know, what happens when I'm not making good art, right? Is that if I'm not making good art and I'm an artist, is there, is there something wrong with me? Is there something inherently flawed with me um, if I'm not, if I can't do what, what I've defined myself as, as being. And, um, and when, when that's their identity and you feel like, all right, then I, and if I'm not doing it well, what, what's, where am I? That can get really tricky and dicey. So um, it takes some practice sometimes to, again, be kind to yourself and, um, and kind of enjoy the process. And, uh, and I've told this story before, but I think it was really helpful when I, when I approached an instructor in college and said, you know, I'm really struggling because I'm not, I, I'm putting too much into each of these drawings and the stress is not working for me. Um, can I make bad drawings? I just asked for permission to make bad drawings because I wasn't giving myself that permission. Um, and. And he said, sure, go ahead. And I, that was the best semester for me for drawing. I, I experimented with materials in new ways. I thought about drawing in new ways. And um, I never would have kind of advanced as quickly as I did that semester without that freedom to, to make bad art, as, as I was describing it in my mind. And so it was helpful to have somebody else give me that permission, again, because I wasn't giving myself that permission. Um, and then eventually you fall into that that uh, that headspace where you enjoy the challenge of it all about the, making those mistakes so you become exciting. All right. Okay. So I'm still using the side of the pencil. I'm simply continuing to block in these values, starting to think more about structure, and I'm and trying to get rid of those lines. If it looks out of focus, it should. It is very blurry right now um, because we're going to go through and then continue to refine the drawing. Uh, now I'm going to kind of squint. And what I'm looking for are these shadow shapes here. And that was a pretty hard line here. 
I'm looking for this path along this, the, the cheek there. There's that transition from light into shadow, and then you have that, that line of termination, that terminator right around here, but it's a very gradual termination. And that, that's the point at which um, on a form shadow, this is a form shadow, it's a part of the form that's in shadow. There's, um, there is a transition from light into shadow, and it's going to be kind of either sharp or it's going to be more diffused. And, and in this case here, it's a fairly diffused uh, transition, and that gets really tricky. So what I'm trying to identify is kind of the, the average, to try to locate that angle in here. And then also try to find that shadow core. There's something happening here in the cheek. And there's a there's a shape, and I find it a little bit. I find it more helpful to use the smaller thumbnail at this stage to work from rather than. So I'm actually just using that little image that's right below me on your screen. That's what I'm looking at as well, and um, that helps me to see the uh, the forms a little bit better. Uh, now, one of the things that's really cool, too, about this light on his cheek is this, this play between light and dark, where we have dark against light. We come over here. Now, this becomes darker than that, and, and it's a bit more subtle. This isn't nearly as bright in here. Um, but rather than draw just a hard line here, I'm thinking about it in terms of this value relationship changing into this value relationship. And part of what using, again, using an app like this, um, one of the, the advantages um, is that it can help kind of offload some of the, the thought processes that might be weighing you down. So when you think about the drawing process, there's so many things that we go through. There's, again, there's, there's gesture, there's line, shape, form, value, texture, there's getting the proportions right, um, there's the entire expression of the character, everything, right? And it can be really overwhelming if that all of that is occupying your brain at one time. Um, so what you might try to do is try to, to kind of divide and conquer, as it were. So tackle one of those issues and then move to the next, move to the next, move to the next. But then also kind of step back and kind of cycle through them again. So you're, you might think about proportion and then you move on to thinking about value. But then you might come back in and just double check those proportions again or double check those values again. Um, and so with, with the, like an app like this, or you know, using a transparency or tracing, how, whatever tool you're using, it helps to offload some of that thinking about proportions so then you can, you can focus on other things. And so it might be a way for you to, to kind of focus on texture, mark making, values or something. Um, and then also with the, uh, these tools like this, it might help you to see, um, let me go like that so that it's a little bit easier to see, but um, when you, you break down the shape uh, at the, I mean, the reference into shapes like this, um, it, it, it kind of can sometimes help you to kind of, uh, kind of advance your own observations, right? So, uh, you know, it's really hard sometimes to look at a reference photo, especially of a portrait, and try to think about it as just a collection of abstract shapes. But using a tool like this might be that thing that gets you over that, that hump and say, oh, now I can see those shapes. Then you go back to looking at the reference image and you're good to go. All right, so you can, you can see it a little bit more clearly. So again, that's how you're using it as a tool. Um, um, or like, I mean, you can also, like I said, if, if, if what you want to do is, is use this to complete the entire drawing and go for it. Um, that, that's, I guess that just, it doesn't really work for me, but I'm grateful for opportunities like this, tools like this that I can, now that I, I kind of know that the basic proportions are in place, I can then focus on some other aspects of it. You know, maybe focus on texture or something or value. And you know, there are, there are some people that um, that that prefer only to work from life, from direct observation. Uh, and I was that way for many many years. Only only worked from from direct observation, and. Um, and then when I started doing this show, working from photographs, because that's really the, the, the most effective way to do a live stream like this is to work from photographs, I find that there's a lot of benefit to it. It allows me to focus on developing certain skills. But I think it's also helpful to um, kind of step out of that comfort zone sometimes and 
We're always doing that as artists, so stepping out of our comfort zone, exploring something new, testing our, our preconceived ideas about how to draw, how to, uh, how to think about the art, the art making process. All right, starting to fixate in along this side here, so I need to move on. So I'm kind of squinting, looking at the reference photo again to kind of come back into this shape. And so what I'm observing right now is the entire shadow shape. Um, and I'm trying hard because I, my brain wants to see the hair as separate from the, the face, right? But there's a form shadow that occupies both of those spaces. And that's what I'm trying to see. And, and it helps to squint the eyes. Or if I use that, if I use that app, it helps to, to see that as well. So I'm going right over that hairline to see this shape here. How are we doing on time? We're about 45 minutes in, and so this is, this is cruising along nicely. And I'm, I'm st stepping back. So I'm, uh, when I look at the screen in front of me, I'm seeing that overhead projection. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, trying to evaluate any kind of distortions in the perspective. Again, just trying to block in the shapes more than anything. One of the other things that can be helpful is to remind ourselves that most drawings go through that ugly duckling stage, right? We talk about that a lot here where, you know, <laughs> when you get to this point in the drawing, you're like, whoa, it's not, not going how I want it to. And, uh, and you got to power through it. You got to get that second wave. You just keep working on it. I, I, to me, drawing gets exciting when there's evidence of the struggle. Um, so I, I get excited when, when something is not going well. Um, not, you know, I, that's not to say that, that, that excitement doesn't come with frustration. It, it is very frustrating. But I've kind of learned through um, many, many frustrating drawing experiences is that, that, that it'll, it'll be all right. And, uh, and then you start to get excited about it. Right, you get to you know, like, oh, this is this this could be a fight, um, and uh, I'm excited to see if I win this battle or not. Again, then, because then that that's that's when, you know, especially when you're working on a drawing and you're, you're not, it's not coming together, and and you start throwing all these tools at it, and you're like, it's not it's not looking right, and then then you start to get creative and you're like, well, maybe I need to try something different, and um, that's when you start to discover new ways of making marks. Uh, so that's the other other thing that I would just encourage you to do if you're struggling with that confidence is get excited by the struggle rather than try to avoid it because that's when you're going to discover something that's going to set you apart from everybody else. All right, let's see. Whew. Greg is saying, I find for myself success doesn't always go along with confidence. Success can be paralyzing by putting too much pressure on yourself to live up to it. Nice. I like it. Uh, that's a great way of describing it. Totally agree, Samuel's saying. Um, yeah, you know, the, uh, yeah, uh, Samuel, I like your, your comment as well. Oh, Sam. Good to see you on here. Um, did you... All right, I'm just looking through here. Um, all right, Cindy is saying, this does help find the mass shape of value. Turn it, there we go. Um, uh, Trina is saying, for those I, I have to work on uh, photos for the, for the past many months, I've been working with fellow artists online and we take turns posting, uh, posing for one another so that we can sketch. Nice, the sketching keeps me working, not enough time for drawing. Yeah, excellent. So, um, yeah, that's an interesting I, that that kind of brings to mind uh, what you know the difference between sketching and drawing, right? I I don't know for me if there really is a, a fundamental difference between the two, but all right, okay. How are we doing here? Kind of asking myself, I suppose. But if everybody else is drawing along, how are your drawings coming? 
Um, if you're new, you're going to want to know that you, know, you can also share your work when you're done at Artist Network. I'm going to do some angle sighting here um, to kind of reestablish this hairline. It got kind of lost in, in looking at that main shadow shape here. Um, and so I could, I could bring back that transparency. Imagine if I, if I bring, that, bring the DaVinci eye over, I can kind of double check it. Say, am I, how am I doing right there? It's also cool about that DaVinci Eye app. Sam there and Trissa, great team, good people. If you have any questions, they, they help you out. So um, you can definitely tell, you can tell you know, with, with tools sometimes if they're, if they're really designed by, by artists, right? And, or, or not. And um, I think for me, I find that that, that app is you can sense that there are people who understand the art making process. Um, all right, so I'm liking the, the softness of the light right now. All right, what is happening in my thinking right here? This, I feel like this needs to be refined, so I'll use some quick angle sighting. So if, if you're new and you say, what the heck is angle sighting? All I'm doing is I'm taking my pencil, I'm closing one eye that flattens my depth perception. So when I take my pencil like this, I can place it directly on top of the reference image, find the angle that I'm targeting, so in this case it's the hairline, lock my wrist so I keep that angle, and bring it in and place it right on top of the drawing. And um, that gives me a, a more a kind of accurate um, description of that angle. Okay, I'm gonna, I wanna really focus on this today. Now I didn't, uh, I, I kinda learned from my, my previous drawing attempt at, with this, the one that I opened the, the show with, and that I spent so much time focusing on the, the perimeter, the, the contour, um, that I kinda left this form shadow for later. Um, and I don't know as if that really served me well, so I'm trying to learn from that previous experience and improve upon it. Uh, now, one of the things that you might find helpful is, um, you know, the, this this particular subject gives us the opportunity to develop a sensitivity to touch. Um, you know, so what I'm thinking about is the pressure of the material on the paper, and in, and and even more um, particular still is where along the path of each stroke am I applying pressure? You know, so it's all happening, it's moving very quickly, but you start to get a sense of, of if the pressure is happening at the center of each, of each uh, mark or at the ends. And I'm really trying to, to lift at the ends to create a soft transition there. Um, so it can be helpful sometimes to, to just think about not, not how the pencil feels in your hand, but what is that, what is happening with the pencil tip on that paper? Where is that pressure? Um, and, and I find that using the side of the pencil gives me a greater range of options. Uh, because you know, when, I, when you're just engaging the tip of the pencil, you're, um, it's just such a small area you know, it's really, it, that's when you're, you're starting to focus on line work. If you're working on value, I find that for me that it's just easier and, and more effective to really use that overhand grip and really think about where that pressure is. Start to think about the direction of your mark, so moving from a kind of a circular mark to kind of blend, um, and then if you need some directional mark to apply some of the cross contour information. So if, you, if you're thinking about this now as a three-dimensional object, what are the paths that might follow up along that object that can help reinforce that sense of volume? Uh, when um, sometimes just holding that in your mind can be helpful. You start to build an intuition about where, uh, you, know, where you need to emphasize your marks, um, how you might change the direction of your marks. So I've kind of lost that, that shadow here. All right.
right, so if I bring this back, what I'm going to do is use my kneaded eraser. Um, I'm going uh, to pull out that highlight here. And I misplaced it. So I can just wipe it out because my hand was in the way. And that's what I was just working on there. There's this, there's this nice light that catches on his cheek right there. Uh, so actually, while I have this out, I might um, I might do some negative drawing in here, kind of refine some of these shapes. I want to start to think through where where the lightest lights might be. So right here on the tip of the nose along that bridge. And when I'm working with the eraser, you know, the remember this is what we say a lot in the show that every every tool you have is an opportunity to contribute to the form. Um, and so when, I'm, when I have this eraser, I'm trying not to think about it as correcting mistakes. I'm trying to think about it as refining lights, right? And so, um, and that can sometimes be a big difference in, in how we kind of execute. So much of drawing is about where our mind is at, right? And so sh simply shifting our um, mindset around how tools are to be used, um, we can... Uh, Uh, we can completely transform our drawing. All right. Whew. Um, Karen is asking, when angle sighting, does the work and reference need to be eye level? Uh, that's a great question. It can be helpful to have them adjacent. Uh, you know, so if you're working from life and you're angle sighting, it can be helpful to have your work kind of right next to the, your your subject, and so you can just kind of transfer like this. Um, and the same if you're working from a digital image, the more you can have them vertical, you know, kind of, kind of next to one another, it just it's just an easier way of doing it. But having said that, you know, a lot can be achieved by simply identifying that angle. And so, you know, in this case, I'm working at an angle uh, relative to the paper. There's, it's on this angled surface. And so if I have a vertical reference and I take that angle, I'm trying to lock that in my mind. Um, and then I, you can kind of you can kind of come in up over your drawing to, to see it. Um, and so you can learn ways of uh, transferring those observations about angles from, from angle sighting if your reference and your drawing are at um, at odd angles to one another, um, but if you're used, if you're getting, if you're new to it and you're you're still getting used to that whole process, then I would say it, you're going to find more success by having your subject and your drawing right next to one another in a, in a kind of a, a site size uh, method way where you're you're matching essentially one to one the the reference to your drawing. All right, so I'm just sharpening up this edge here. So when you're thinking about sharpening edges, you know, you can use a line to kind of describe that, that edge. I'm trying to use um, value relationships to define that edge. So what I'm doing is, I'm, again, I'm using this overhand grip, working my way back up to this edge. And as I get in there, you can see I have this kind of modified overhand grip where I have some stability between my fingers here. And I can kind of roll my hand up as I get into that edge. And I'm, I'm actually getting lighter on my touch because I don't want to be too heavy there. Uh, and my main goal is to try to create a smooth transition as I go up to that edge. And then when I get to that edge, then I'm really trying to sharpen it and then feather it back out. So you're kind of coming up to that edge and then back away. Um, and I, I do that because um, I was getting really frustrated by what I call the halos <laughs> in the drawing. So uh, when I was, uh, when I would, uh, when I wasn't conscious of what's happening at that edge, I would create some variation right up along that edge that would parallel the contour of, especially a portrait, parallel the contour of the subject. 
and then that everything got kind of flattened out. So I, would, I think it can be really helpful to pay attention to that right up along that edge, what is happening. And you might find it also helpful to change the direction of your marks. So in this case, we have a vertical contour edge. If I turn my, my pencil this way and I run these background marks horizontally, in a subtle way, we're, we're, we're creating a, a division in our minds. We recognize that if those marks are running this way, and this is a vertical edge, they must not belong together. They must be separate forms, and you're more likely to create some separation. With marks that parallel that path, um, there's a chance that then the viewer will look at that and say, well, if those marks are running in the same direction as the contour, they must belong together. So then they pop forward, right? So then you, you, you end up losing some of that depth that you're trying to create. Um, but then you, I run that risk here. So now if I'm running these marks horizontally up to that edge, I have to be really careful. Or what I might do is just go like this, go right over, go right over that edge so that I have a nice clean overlap. And that can be a little scary, but you, then you just have to have faith that you can kind of clean up that, that edge for that nice, that nice sharp edge. And so again, now that if I, if I leave those marks here to clearly indicate a horizontal um, pathway for that background, that'll help to create some division. And then if I carry that across to this side, then the viewer will look at that and say, well, they're running in the same direction, so they must belong together. That must be part of the same surface. Um, and that'll help to push the wall back on this side as well. Those are some of the subtle things that can, for, and, and when evaluating my own work, I like to pay attention to because it can um, often add just that little touch more to bring depth to the drawing. So I'm going to do the same thing over here, run these marks horizontally, going right over the edge, bringing uh, the eraser in. And kind of cleaning it up, and I can suggest some of that texture in here now as well. All right. Rachel, I'm glad to hear. Britton, if you're still watching, thank you again. All right, so what I'm doing now is I'm um, thinking about um, just again doing some negative drawing here. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the flat side. Since I don't need a lot of precision here, I'm going to use the flat side of this. And if anything, that what that's going to do is it's going to continually kind of sharpen the eraser. So kind of define that edge a little bit. Um, And now uh, this kind of brings to mind, you know, the, you know, why, why we're talking about edges so much here is that that can really um, play a significant role in the, the sense of light and the sense of realism in a drawing. So if your goal is to create a realistic drawing, uh, then you want to be very careful with how the edges are being managed, because um, in life, uh, lines don't exist. Lines are abstract symbols that we've created to represent the edge of a three-dimensional object. Um, and it makes sense that we use those. And lines can be very expressive and add a lot to work. So it's not to say lines are bad, shapes are good. Um, but if you're going for a sense of realism, you just want to have control over your use of those. Um, and so in this way, I, I, I am feeling compelled to spend more time um, really kind of trying to deconstruct edges and I like this light right in here so as I as I'm looking at that edge with my eraser here I'm looking for that that main shape and then kind of breaking it up a little bit to soften it um, and kind of capture the quality of the hair. All right. I'm 
Samuel will say, the cool thing about using new tools or trying new techniques is it helps you figure out new elements and ways to improve your drawing that you never would have thought of before. Yes, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I feel like it, it took me 20 minutes to get to trying to articulate that and what you did in, the, in one sentence. So thank you. Um, nicely done. Um, all right, so again, if anybody has any questions, anybody new here, anybody watching for the first time, I see a lot of familiar names. Um, if you're new, I'd love to see where you're viewing from. Uh, I don't know why I did that, I was, but I like it. I think I'm gonna keep it. <laughs> All right, let me shift to the 12B because I don't, I, don't, I don't have a reason. I just felt like picking up the 12B pencil. Um, I think I just wanted to go a little darker. So I, I have this sharpened back. I'm gonna continue to use the, the side of the pencil, but I, yeah, I guess at, now that I add that value in here, um, it helps to uh, helps to put the rest of the values in context. So we, we talk about that a lot in the show, right? Remember that values are relative um, and we are constantly calibrating our understanding, our interpretation of values. Uh, and so it can be helpful to challenge those calibrations. So what was happening is I was seeing this as, as dark when it really isn't. It's a very fairly light gray actually. And so as I go darker, it helps me to see those values more objectively. Uh, and, I, and I prefer to use the side of the pencil on this just to create more kind of natural looking marks. And as I start to introduce lines, then it, I run the risk of creating divisions that are difficult to um, deconstruct later. Uh, and I could talk through what that means. But when we talked about we said we talked about lines a little bit earlier that lines don't exist in nature they're they're symbols to an edge so when then we perceive a line in a drawing we uh, we we're often we often then assume that it's the edge of something and so if I if I draw a line right in here and it kind of becomes a, a confusing symbol to a viewer they're like well. That's the middle of the head, but there's a line that suggests it's actually a separate form. And the line, then the brain has to go through these, these various thought processes for kind of understanding and interpreting that form. Pulling out just a little bit of light there. No! My lead broke. Or my... All right, well, that goes away. That was entirely my fault. I was being too aggressive when I was sharpening it earlier. All right, so uh, I'm gonna pull out the, uh, I got a 10B, got my razor blade. I think I just need to carve a little bit more. 10B is close enough to the 12B. All right, so that was a quick and dirty sharpening <laughs> of this pencil. Not the prettiest of things, but that's all right. I want to keep drawing. All right, um, so where am I now? All right, I want to keep, I'm going to keep working up on this side. And what I'm looking for is this, these, these shapes, these, these cool kind of wisps of these shadows here. Um, and I'm trying to think about that in terms of shadow shapes, not in terms of hair. I wanna talk about how, ways that we can create texture, the illusion of hair in a little bit. But it all starts from really the, um, you know, the, the understanding that you know, the, the head is a solid three-dimensional form and it try to observe that, that full three-dimensional shape uh, and make sure that that is established before drawing the hair. And hair is one of those details that can be com very compelling, right? And we want to get into that and we want to do that detail because it can be very satisfying to draw these nice lines. 
but it becomes a challenge when it becomes um, detached from the form. We want to we want to use texture, or I want to use texture. I don't want to say we because I don't know. There's probably gonna somebody on here that has a completely different outlook. I like to use texture in a way that reinforces the form. So that becomes my primary focus: is does does that texture tell me more about that three-dimensional structure, or does it inhibit that? And um, and so I'm trying to gradually bring out the texture here through uh, my focus on the three-dimensional form. So thinking about that transition from light into shadow. Now it becomes a bit of a, a challenge here. So there's some light catching in here and here, um, but you can start to see aside from those, those hot spots of light, there becomes a shadow core kind of right in here. Then we get some bounce light in on this side and that edge right in here starts to get lost. And so I'm going to hold those observations and see if I can um, construct something from those. So kind of working from the back forward, keep moving back and forth. And then as I, as I move forward, I'm gradually increasing the pressure to, um, to bring, come into that shadow core, making it a little bit darker. This is too big. And then, you know, if I need to, I can, you know, I could bring, this is another spot where I might bring in the, the, the app, right? And, um, and kind of double check some of the shapes, but I, I feel like I, it's gonna wing it at this point. Um, and, and again, this is where you're in control of, of the degree of accuracy in your drawing. Soften that a little bit, and then I'm gonna come around here. There's a light that catches here, but if I think beyond that that little hot spot there, if I look at that that overall three-dimensional form, that part of that shadow core emerges on this side, and then kind of quickly transitions into light there. All right. Deanne Webb, I always have problems with portraits. I am too critical of myself, but wow, I am blown away with this one. Glad to learn a new technique. All right. That makes me feel fantastic. So I can't wait to see it. I hope you post it on Artist Network. All right, where are we at? We're about an hour and a quarter in. So some decent time. I think we'll, we'll probably finish this up right at about two hours. Um, I'd love to get some feedback on the video and sound. I've made some adjustments here. I've got a, a different computer than I've been using. And um, I also uh, was able to, yeah, I've got the I've got new adapters for the camera and the mic to, um, so that I don't have to worry about them dying on me. And so I've been taking some time to kind of fiddle with the, the settings on everything. If anybody has any suggestions for improvement, just let me know. Uh, and that's true for both the, the video setup as well as the drawing itself. Um, I always welcome feedback. You all are very kind. I don't have to manage harsh and negative comments because everybody's cool, but uh, feel free to say, hey, something's wrong, something's off, or double check this, double check that. Um, many of you have really helped me through some tricky spots in the past, so that's why we're here. We're drawing together. Um, it's not just watch me draw. I hope, I hope it's that we're all drawing together. Okay, what am I at now? Where am I at? All right, I am going to bring out my blending stump. Um, Wanda, welcome. You're new from British Columbia. Good to see you here. Um, all right, LA for Dream saying that it looks and sounds good. All right, so I've got this, this well-used blending stump that's loaded with graphite. So I have some that I use for charcoal, some that I use for graphite. So I was careful to choose the one for, um, for graphite here. 
and I'm I'm going to use this as, as a way to kind of contribute to the form. Uh, so if I if I apply too much pressure with this, you know, it's kind of filling in the tooth of the paper. But if I apply too much pressure, it's going to create these blotches that are going to be ineffective. So I'm starting with a light touch, trying to think about the structure of Britain's head here. And if you know, if you're not sure what direction to make your marks, use a circular one. An omnidirectional mark can be helpful in so many ways. Start with a light pressure and then gradually increase and let that um, let the, the the blending stump roll in your fingers because as you as you as you're working on the paper it's building up it's picking up some material and it's depositing it and so I find it really effective to to rotate it so that I'm creating an even distribution on on this and so I'm not building up like a bunch of residue in one area and not on another. And what I like about the blending stump is it allows me to see, sneak up on some of the subtle elements in here. So as I work on the nostril, for example, rather than using, a, using the, the pencil and creating a hard line, I'm going to use the blending stump because it's just a, it's a little bit more gentle. And then I can start to, I can kind of be, um, a little bit more tentative in and kind of sneak up on some of these forms. Uh, so as I look at if I look at the nose, for example, so this is this is where I run into trouble. Right? So when you focus on a form, on a, a, an aspect of a form. So if I focus on the nose, for example, it heightens the contrast. And so I have, then I have a I have a um, a natural kind of desire to then heighten the contrast in the drawing, um, but that it's all very subtle. If you squint at the reference photo, this side here, everything is just cut, gets kind of lost. Those values are very close to one another. So if you squint at a form and an edge disappears, that tells you that there's a very narrow value difference between the two. Right? They're actually closer in value than you might think when you stare at something, when you really focus on it. And so um, this is where it can be really helpful to um, use the indirect gaze. So um, look at and study the forms indirectly. So what I mean by that is as I'm looking at the reference photo, if I'm studying this part of the nose, I'm actually putting my, my focus say, beyond, say on this part in the reference. Uh, I'm looking here but putting my awareness on that. Um, and so I find that to be really helpful when um, when trying to observe a particularly subtle areas like this. And then we have a really subtle transition here. I can indicate the shapes around the lips. That's a bit too harsh, uh, so I'm going to lift with the, the uh, kneaded eraser here. And so there's going to be a lot of work happening in this small area right in here. And, and in particular, pay attention to the shape of the lips. Um, and again, try to think about them as shapes of light and dark. Um, so if you think about the, the lips as having an outline, and you draw that line on your, your, your drawing, um, if you indicate that there, um, it can sometimes be hard to remove that. If you really observe this photo, it's a very subtle value relationship between that upper lip and then you know, the, the upper lip and then that top lip. And then we come into a shadow here on that lower lip. And this, again, this is where I find the, the blending stump a little bit, just a little bit more delicate, so I can, I can sneak up on it a little bit more. And 
and kind of test out some of these shapes. Test out the shapes of light and dark um, uh, before really committing to it. Uh, so generally, uh, along the edges of the mouth, it gets softer as well. But it all depends on how the light is functioning. There's a kind of a darker shadow under here, for example. So when I see that, I can just kind of lean in a little bit more on the, on the blending stump um, and then kind of transition out And I want to kind of reiterate too that portraits are hard. <laughs> so um, I, have to, I have to be kind to myself. I want you to be kind to yourself because this stuff's not easy. Um, I have nothing but respect and admiration for portrait artists because <laughs> that's so hard. Um, I find the, the landscape to be far more forgiving and I think that's one of the reasons I gravitate towards that more than I do portraits. But it's such a good opportunity for growth to, to work on portraits. I think, I think portraits just intimidate me. Um, not just because they're hard subjects to draw, but you know, I think we, as, as humans, we have a, uh, an innate ability to you know, interpret expression and likeness and uh, so there just feels like there's so much more at stake. And sometimes I just, I, as I tighten up, sometimes I can feel there's part of me that just wants to right across the drawing, just <laughs> make a big old mark and kind of get loose. I, I, I kind of fight those two instincts. In a, in a landscape, I could do that. In a portrait, it's a little less um, receptive to that mentality. All right. so. What I'm going to do is, uh, I'm kind of liking the way this chin is now defined a little bit more. Um, and as I, as I come up here, I'm going to find another opportunity to drop in a line. I'm going to sharpen up that profile. And just in a few areas, seeing if I can bring a little bit more definition there. All right, Diane B13, the audio is fine and your sketch and photo are clear, but you're not as focused. Not bad, but different. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I do feel that. I feel like I'm a little bit more scattered today um, than, than normal, so it makes sense that that came through. Um, I, I think I, I get that way a lot with portraits in general, um, is that I, I do get intimidated, and so um, I try my best to kind of practice what I preach and, and say be kind to yourselves, but it's not always easy, especially with portraits, so um, I do want to make good drawings, even though I, I know cognitively that these are practice drawings. So this is all about developing skill um, and just kind of bringing bringing the benefit of drawing into my day. All right, so this is a fun, fun spot here. So what I'm kind of doing is I'm kind of circling around. The, I'm trying not to get fixated too much on any individual features. I'm kind of, I worked a little bit, now I'm kind of backing out. Things where I can breathe a little bit more easily, take some pressure off, um, and then come back into it. If you, when I'm, when I'm here, What's interesting is that we see a, a strong distinction right in here with the, that chin against the light. And then we see some bounce light coming up under here against the, the, the cast shadow here and the form shadow of, the, of that jaw there. So what I'm going to do is as I, as I kind of work on sharpening the edge with the eraser here, just with a very light pressure, try to, try to indicate that jawline. All very subtle.
and this is where I think it might change the direction of my marks just to create some visual separation there. And so there's that little bounce light, but it's a bit too strong. I can knock that down a little bit. The thing is, like, we're, we're, we're generally really good at seeing subtle variations in value. Um, and so there's a, a natural tendency to overstate um, those value relationships in your drawing. So I have to kind of keep myself in check a little bit with those value relationships. So for example, I, I notice there's a little bit of bounce light happening here. So some light is coming in off, off of surface over here, bouncing and hitting this side of his, of his uh, jaw. And uh, so my, because I observe that, there's that natural inclination to make it really kind of clear and explicit. Um, and um, and that, that can sometimes degrade the form. It can, I can make that too bright. Um, and that, so if I, now if I squint at the reference and I squint at my drawing, what pops out is the ear. There's just too much contrast there. So I can easily kind of wash that down. So what I'm, I'm putting a wash on top of it. I'm just creating a smooth, even tone of value using the side of the pencil to diminish that. And then that helps to drop it into shadow a little bit more. And then if I need to add a little bit more definition, I can come back in in some areas. And I had to say, like, really, especially especially early on, but I, one of my challenges when working with portraits is, is that, is to embrace the subtlety in some areas. So in that way, I just I I achieved the same contrast as I had a few minutes ago, but I brought everything down in value. So I darkened everything um, kind of equally to put that into shadow. And one of the things that's challenging right now is that there's a glare from the light shining off of the graphite here. So when I look at it in, in person, in real life here, I, I can't really see what's happening. Um, but so I have to look at it uh, from the projection overhead. So keep that in mind while you're working as well, is if you're not regularly changing your relationship to the drawing, um, you can sometimes be surprised by the results. So you know, stand it up, look at it from a distance, take a photograph of it, hold it in front of a mirror, things like that to change that context, change your relationship to the drawing so you can see it more objectively. Uh, Diane B13, thanks for the good hint about using the blending stunt to construct the mouth. Uh, oh, <laughs> Diane, you know, the video isn't quite as clear, not me. All right, um, oh, I feel like I'm just as scattered. Um, it's interesting. I wonder if it's the, well, the drawing should be in focus. Oh, actually. Let me see if I can. There we go, that sharpened it up a little bit more. It was a little bit out of focus there, so thank you for observing that. It's hard to tell because the whole drawing itself is rather unfocused. So, um, as it's in, intended to be. All right, so now let's, let's do the features. This is gonna be tricky. <laughs> Kind of gearing myself up for it. Um, let me turn this back on. Okay, D I'm going to double check. I'm going to work on the from the mouth up, saving the eyes for last. Um, I don't have a particular reason. I just I think I'm mostly intimidated by the eyes. Um, but I often will do that. Uh, do the eyes last? I think part because I kind of train myself to to save the best for last. I feel like there's, there can be, a, and it, what I've experienced um, for myself is that I'll you know, get the eyes in and, and then there's, um, and they kind of lose steam a little bit. So I'm just, I'm trying to really sneak up on, 
on the proportion. So I'm focusing on a few key elements, the corners of the mouth, this center of the upper lip here, which and I know it has an anatomical term, but I do not remember. And, um, and then this lower lip, that the, the height of that lower lip. And I feel like everything is generally working out okay. While I have the transparency up, I'm gonna indicate, I'm gonna refine the, the nostril here, the outer edge of the nostril. And what's most important right in here, I think, is this shape. Uh, on the uh, the inside of the nostril. Um, now, I say that it's most important because I I'm letting um, letting my observations tell me what's important. So if I squint at the reference photo, this disappears. So I'm going to say, well, if that disappears, it's less important. Um, but what stands out is this shape. That ultimately is what's defining the nose, is the shape of that shadow, not um, kind of the, the, the all these subtle values in, on this side of that nose. Um, now, that may be different than what was, is happening in your brain. If you're looking at it like that, when I'm looking at it, all I'm thinking about is that profile and the shape of the nose, and I want to draw that on there. Um, but I'm going to let, um, I'm going to let the, the reference tell me what is most important. So again, by, by squinting um, and seeing what disappears, that's the reference telling me where I need to put more focus on. And that is the shape of this shadow here. So as we're, as we're looking at the, the shape of the nose, we have, again, this kind of this uh, parentheses shape here, and then this just a subtle curve. And on the inside here, it's a little bit darker. And I'm just pulling down. It kind of softens on, on the bottom edge of that to give it a little bit of depth. Now, as I come up here, be thinking about the direction of my marks to reinforce the structure of the nose. So trying to think about the planes of the nose. There's this basically a face front plane here and then it turns down the side, you know, not at a 90 degree angle. Um, and then, then here we have another shift in the planar, planar structure here. Um, and then there's the shadow core is right in on this side. That tends, seems to be where it gets the darkest. And then you get some bounce light in this side. Um, we get some, we get a shadow core in here as well, where it's darker inside that eye socket. And so when I'm when I get to the eye, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build a structure around the eye and make the eye a consistent part of the form of the head, not a separate element that's pasted on there. Uh, and again, that's a natural instinct that I've had to overcome because you know, I, I think it's very natural to want to get in there and draw the line around the contour of the eye and then kind of fill it in. Um, and I found that over, over the years, I've had greater success when I don't do that, when I think about that structure, so I'll kind of indicate that inner corner of that eye quickly, but kind of move back into here. I can change up the direction of my marks here. And now there's, a, again, there's shadow core Kind of right in here, the darker that's the kind of the darkest part of the shadow. It's called the shadow core. At least that's what I call it. It's one of the cool things about art is you know learning the different terms that people use for things. And then you know that, that kind of brings up the question is like does it is it important to know those terms? And I think it can be helpful to some degree, but I think if you always default to the idea of just seeing things as abstract shapes and just trying to kind of arrange these shapes and values or colors on a surface, you can, you can achieve a strong drawing without a thorough um, vocabulary 
around you know the anatomy of the head or um, certain artistic terms. Don't let that stop you if you if you feel like your vocabulary is limited to some degree. And I, I like to remind myself that because um, what can sometimes happen is that we we think about drawing a portrait as hard or um, you know, drawing a landscape is hard or something. We, we apply difficulty to certain subjects as saying as, as somehow more inherently challenging to draw. Um, and what I found is that ultimately what drawing is, is a set of decisions that we make um, as we interpret our surroundings. Uh, and we can apply those, those decisions to simple objects, we can apply them to complex objects. Um, you know, complex objects just requires more kind of mental load, just more thinking. Um, but there's nothing fundamentally different in the decisions we make about them. They're just more complex forms. All right, so I'm trying to be subtle with the, the nose here. And what I'm observing is the, the light here on the bridge at that turn in the nose being stronger, we lose some of that here, and then we gain it again, the brightest bright right in here. So now we have a difference in value between, between this light here and then that light there. Uh, and there's a little bit of kind of structure on that side of the of the cheek, there's some light kind of catching in there that I'm going to try to try to capture. And so in this way, I've enhanced the that line on the tip of the nose to help project that forward. And I'm asking myself, does that is that helpful? You know, does it does it create the depth that I want? Or does it make the drawing too heavy? Because I, I want to find that balance. Um, I can, I can sharpen up this a little bit under here. I'm just kind of sneaking up on it to try to bring that a little bit more contrast around the nose that we don't see in the reference image, but to see if it's helpful at all. Um, and I prefer the approach of, of kind of slowly approaching that rather than creating a strong defined line that we then have to try to break up. All right, actually, I'm going to come back down here. I'm going to move into the eyes, but I feel like I need a little bit more definition here. So with the, the lips, I'm going to switch this overhand grip to try to indicate some of the creases on the lips. And a lot of these details is achieved just through very subtle tapping. Just kind of dropping the... the the tip of the pencil on the page, thinking more about the direction of the marks. So if here, for example, trying to, trying to think about the direction of the marks, the shape of the shadows on the, uh, on the lips. Come back over here and I'm actually gonna use this to put a little bit more definition on the shape of the lip there. And I'm going to use this eraser here to pull out some of those highlights. And then looking at, uh, looking at just the subtle lights in here. It's all all very subtle, but I think it my my suggestion there is to try to try to arrive at those forms without using a line as much as possible. Try to use the side of that pencil. And drop in a little bit more, add a little bit more depth to that shadow.
Oh man, I just realized I wasn't breathing. <laughs> Remember to breathe, it's an important thing to do. First rule of drawing is to breathe. All right, so when I'm working with the, the kneaded eraser, um, you know, similar to the other erasers, uh, it, it's about kind of sneaking up on it again. So kind of being a little bit gentle with the, um, the pressure and then gradually increasing it um, and paying attention to the, where, the, where the weight is being applied. You know, so um, just like when using a, a pencil, like there's, you know, when you're working with charcoal or, or graphite, um, erasers, if there's, when it comes to kind of touch, sensitivity to that, there, all of that applies. All right. Here we go. David, welcome. Glad you just joined. Um, Samuel, yes, another reason to keep checking the drawing from different perspectives. The worst is when you're doodling and slouching at an angle and then sit up and realize your doodle is skewed. Yes, that would happen so much when I would be, be teaching in person. You know, I'd have my back turned to a class and I'd have my, my board off to the side so they could see what I'm drawing. I'm trying to draw a portrait, talk about some basic proportions. And so I'm going like this and then I step in front of the drawing and it's, it's totally off. <laughs> And then the class looks at me like I have no idea what I'm doing because, you know, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, keeping things symmetrical and, and it's, not, it's obviously asymmetrical uh, in what I've just drawn. And um, so I had to practice that a little bit and learn that I can't draw offset like that. Um, all right. <laughs> well, that's, that's a great feeling when you, you spend all that time working on uh, drawing only to, to find that you, know, I, you had compensated for a, a perspective distortion there. All right, so as I'm, as I'm getting into this eye here, again, do your best to try to see this as a basic shape. So what, what can be helpful sometimes is to hold in your mind what that structure actually is. So that's a sphere inside a socket with the eyelids wrapped up over it. So as we look at that upper lip, I mean, upper lip, the upper eyelid, you see the lashes come off, they're wrapping around the sphere of it, right? So um, you can see kind of a two-dimensional shape, um, but also if you understand it three-dimensionally, we have this shape here across the top. And then as we come in under here, in a very small amount of space, we're wrapping around that, that eyeball. And now the, the eyelashes on that lower eyelid are almost invisible. That light is so strong, it's kind of washed them out. Um, so what's really defining the structure here is getting this shape correct here, and then the shape of the ellipse of the, the iris and the pupil of the eye. Um, and so again, what we're looking at is a sphere, and then you have the iris, which is a circle within that. Um, the pupil is the hole at the bottom of the cone of that, you know, so the, the iris actually dips inward as like a cone, um, and the, the pupil is the hole at the bottom of that cone. And uh, because we're looking at an angle, they're not quite, they're not stacked up on top of one another. Um, so the, if we were to place that pupil in here, it's actually going to be closer to this side of the iris, and you're going to see a little bit more of that, because we're looking across that cone that's actually receding into the eye there. Uh, and, and then all of that is squished into an ellipse because we're looking across that, that circular form. Uh, so when in doubt though, you know, just trust the shapes. But what happens sometimes is we, we understand the iris and the pupil to be circles so we have a tendency to draw them as such. Um, but whereas, where optically they're actually these unique forms. So I'm gonna try to erase out that highlight. And then just try to soften up a little bit 
I want to feel like I've made that a little bit too too sharp in there. All right. Um, and I can bring up. So if I if I were to bring over the the DaVinci Eye app, I don't I don't have it quite aligned from here. So I'll have to bring up my own transparency so it would look like this. And I can toggle that back and forth and you can see some difference, differences there. And so with that off, what I noticed is that there's a slight difference right in here. I could tell that something was off in here, but I couldn't see what. And that's another advantage to using a tool like that. It's, and we've talked about that before. Um, the analogy I use is of tuning a guitar by ear, if you've ever done that, you know, where um, you, know, you have an, an, the, 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 the low string is an E, the next string is the A, and if you go to the fifth fret on the E, that should make an A. So then the, you, you fret that E and you compare it to the open A string and, and you try to get them to match. And there's, when they're obviously different, when one is way lower or higher than the other, you can hear it. And so then you start tuning it, and eventually they get close together, and it gets really hard to tell whether one is higher or lower. You can tell that they're different, but it's hard to know in what way. Um, and it, that's where like, it, developing that sensitivity um, can be really helpful, and it takes practice. Um, and the same can be with lots of aspects of drawing where sometimes you can tell like it doesn't look quite right, but is the shape too big, too small? It's so close, I can't quite tell. And so having, having that app, like that DaVinci Eye app, um, is, is a way to help become aware of that. It's just like using a tuner <laughs> to, to, to help you if you're, if you're trying to develop the skill of tuning a guitar by ear. Um, sometimes it can be really helpful to have the tool of using a tuner to say, hey, no, you're off. Here's, here's what it should be. And then you hear it, and then you try to do it by ear again, and then you might, and then you might use, the, the, uh, you might use the, a tuner again to, to help you hear it, and then eventually you'll develop that skill. All right, so I've kind of lost that edge there. So what I'm going to do I'm going to anticipate where that corner of the eye is. So just like I was, just like the analogy I was using of tuning a, a guitar by ear, I imagine it's true with pretty much any instrument. Um, I'm going to kind of get close, give myself a little bit of information based on what I'm observing here, how it feels. And then I'm going to bring this back, and I'm going to double check. So here's where I have that corner. Yes, and it aligns. Here's where I have the pupil. Yes, and it aligns. OK. I'll pull that back. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. I don't know if anybody else uses tools like this in that particular way, but that's the way it, it, help, it helps me to conceive of using those tools is Um, it, like I said, it gets really tricky sometimes when things are very subtly different. It happens a lot when painting, when looking at color relationships, when you're, especially when you're managing neutral colors. Uh, it gets really hard to see, am I, is, that, is it warmer? Is it cooler? Do I need to add blue? Do I need to add orange? You know, when you have two colors that are very different, if you have a red apple and green grapes, you have, you have very distinct hue differences that you can account for. Um, but then when you start to get in to um, some neutrals, it gets really challenging um, because of the because of that um, the value and color relativity. You might take a neutral that looks purple in one context and green in another, just depending on what's next to it. All right, so I'm kind of taking a break from the eye, I'm focusing again back on that structure. Now that I have a little bit more of the face established, I want to get back in there and and build more of that structure for this portrait here. Uh, right in, I kind of lost that path. Right in here, there's a nice dark path of that shadow core. All right, 
so now I'm going to go back into the eye here. Actually, I want to want to lift off that highlight. I got to support the the eraser a little bit. Use the corner so I get a nice sharp um, highlight, which often gets overstated. And then you can come back in and cut into it a little bit. And one of the things that um, you, you might also observe with the iris and the eye is, is to soften the edge there a little bit more. Um, I, I, for me, it's something I've, I've struggled with is I'll overstate it. I'll draw a sharp edge there. And then it, it kind of separates from the eyeball. It's all one, one sphere. Um, so you just want to be kind of delicate in there. And, and you can notice then, you know, what's nice about this pose that, that Britton struck for us is that um, you can see, especially on that lower eyelid, how it's catching the light. You know, so we don't have to draw that explicitly. You see that really clearly on this one. It's hard to just even locate that lower eyelid because of the way the light is um, interacting there. And then it, it kind of falls into shadow as we wrap around here. All right, so we have it there. Just be careful not to overstate the uh, the whiteness of the eyes. But the the whites of the eyes are really strong right in here. You have this thin sliver. So when I'm when I'm drawing this side of the iris. Kind of using a circular mark to create a soft, slightly softer edge there, so it's not a hard line. And then we have um, the eyelashes are pretty subtle in here. We have a crease right in here. So with the eyeball, with the structure of the eye, you had that upper eyelid. That, that initial flap of skin kind of folds in underneath then the other flap of skin that comes up over the eye socket. So that's what we're seeing right in here. Um, and in, if, in terms of kind of capturing the age of your subject, that's something to look at. That's one of the areas that changes with age is the, the depth of the lines around the eyes. So in addition to kind of the proportions it's um, there are kind of structural changes that happen as well. All right, so I feel like that's working out pretty well. Um, now with now with this, I'm going to take the the corner of the eraser, kind of lift off some of the light along that lower eyelid, soften a little bit to suggest the eyelashes there. And the light's kind of catching the eyelashes on that upper eyelid, too. And so if we look at the structure of the eye here, because we're at that three-quarter view, again, the, the eyeball is a sphere, but we're looking kind of up and around so that this inside corner is kind of farther back. It's wrapping around there. And then we're coming up around the eye bit, eyeball and then back around here. And then the, the eyeball kind of sits high in the eye socket. So you know, the, the pupil is often closer to the upper eyelid. And then it curves out underneath a, a bit farther. You know, so it's not the eyelids aren't symmetrically placed up on over the the eyeball. They, they kind of they they kind of come down a little bit. So the eyeball actually kind of cuts in underneath it a little bit more, um, and we start to see that a little bit with from this angle here. All right, so where are we at now? I'm going to kind of step back a little bit. I've lost the sharp point on my my dark pencil here, so I'm going to try to sharpen it a little bit by drawing some of these other. Um, areas here, work on the background, work on the shirt a little bit. So 
So as I'm doing that, I'm building in some, some contrast there, um, and I'm sharpening the pencil using this overhand grip. How's everybody else's drawing? Are they, are they coming along okay, or? Anybody stuck? Uh, there's this shadow right under here that I think is important. And I wanna, uh, we're gonna enhance the chin just a little bit to pop that forward. Um, what do I wanna do here? Actually, what I wanna do is I wanna contrast that, that subtle line on the chin. I'm gonna get rid of the line back in here against that neck. And in doing so, I'm hoping that it's actually gonna create a little bit more depth. So I just took those lines right over that edge and then I'm gonna use this eraser to cut back in and create a value relationship there rather than using a line to define that edge. And my hope, again, is to, in a subtle way, create a little bit more depth to bring that line forward. Still a little bit too, too prominent there. There we go, I like that edge a bit better. Okay, so now I think we can kind of get to the hair and kind of finish and kind of refine the hair a little bit. So as you can see, it's really built up a tone here. As we've been wiping down the drawing, those lights have become kind of fuzzy. And that's been intentional because now we want to lift out those highlights. So this is all about creating a sense of structure around the, the hair. Again, it's, we're going to be adding kind of details. We're going to refine it farther by adding these details, but we want it to be in service of the form. So I want to evaluate that form first. Does the head feel three-dimensional is what I'm asking myself. Um, and I feel like I do need to come in a little bit more in this area and drop in more of that shadow. So at this case, now I switch to this overhand grip because this allows me to use the side of the pencil, but I'm going to be using it linearly. So um, by, by laying it flat like this, that this, this edge of the, 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 um, the cylinder of that lead becomes a, a point. Um, and uh, I'm thinking about the direction that the hair is flowing as well as the shape of that shadow. So since I have that shadow largely established, then what I can do is I can run my marks in the, the, f the direction of the flow of that hair along that shape. And in doing that, it starts to create marks that feel more naturally formed. They start to suggest the shapes of the shadow that's formed by the locks of the hair rather than individual strands of hair, if that makes sense. So it's just these kind of quick vibrations of the pencil, kind of thinking about, the again, the grain, the flow of that hair, but using the the side of the pencil, because that side of the pencil is, is coming in contact with the paper at just that one point, and if you keep rolling it in your fingers, you're always going to end up with kind of a sharp point that you can utilize. You're not going to develop those flat spots that are going to help, they're going to lose the, the detail. So in that way, you know, hair can be sometimes intimidating because it makes sense that our conscious minds are saying, there's a trillion hairs. <laughs> that, how do I manage that? You can't do it all. Uh, and so um, if you, again, think about it being in service of the form, make sure that the, the, the three-dimensional form of the head is the primary goal here. And then you, start, then you break that form down into these locks, these clumps of hair. And then I just use the side of the pencil to suggest, suggest the, uh, the texture a bit more, moving the pencil in the, in the flow, the direction of that, the flow of the hair. And it's kind of a scooping motion in a way. Like it's, I'm kind of scooping like this. Um, 
and it, it leads to marks that feel kind of naturally formed. You want to think about the, the rhythm of your marks, trying to avoid creating stripes because he doesn't have stripes on the head. It's, but there are these distinct bands of value. But they're not evenly spaced. They're not the same you know, size and shape. And they're simply replicated in a pattern. But you know, play around with how you use the pencil um, to, to suggest the texture. I gotta kind of contort myself a little bit. And you can see I'm kind of breaking up those those shadow shapes a bit. So it's not just one, one smooth movement, it's a series of movements that accumulate together. And then, and so now we, we have this nice kind of average value for the lights and the hair, and we can come back in and establish the highlights. So let me get the first this cool little wisp here. All right, so now with this eraser, uh, and I have it kind of shaved down to a fine point, I want to try to identify where the light is striking the strongest right here. So on a three-dimensional form, you're going to have a highlight. The, the, you're going to have a light side, so this area is the light side of the, essentially the, the sphere of the head. Um, and then within that, you're going to have a hot spot where the light is the strongest. That's the highlight. And so that's what I'm trying to observe. And in general, if I squint and I get kind of trying to imagine all of the, the detail gone, what would that shape of light be? And there's this kind of band right across in here. And so it's this kind of flicking motion, kind of starting at the center of where I think that path of light will be, kind of pulling up in a way then kind of pushing as well. And, and I found that if you, if you alternate kind of dragging and pulling, dragging and pulling, it creates a kind of more naturally appearing marks. And just make a few marks and then move on to avoid kind of the rhythm of it all and avoid creating stripes. Um, and you might play around with pressure as well. So if you just lightly scrape the eraser across the surface, it's going to blend more than anything. And that can be another way to um, kind of refine the flow and the grain of the, uh, that hair. Here it really kind of catches, but it's not a solid line there. There you have it. I feel like that's working out okay. You know, might be able to lean in a little bit more in some of these areas to pull out kind of stronger light, but. I think for the most part, it's, it's working out OK. So how would everybody do? I want to get back to the chat, make sure I don't miss anything. As I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about enhancing the lights here. We have this nice dark shadow, so it creates a strong contrast. And it's, that contrast is kind of at the turn of the head from the, from the front to the side. And that helps to bring that forward as a three-dimensional object. Um, That's kind of what I was thinking there. A little bit of bounce light in here and happening, and suggesting some of that the hair. Um, Cindy is saying, slowly getting past the ugly stage, but I like getting into the zone. That's awesome. The zone is the best place to be. Um, Oh yeah, and then Samuel saying, uh, one tip is that flashing the transparency on and off, especially when the opacity is turned all the way up, lets you see the difference in color values super easy. Yes. 
because that's what this does too. I didn't get to that part. Let me kind of switch this back. That's the other cool thing that this app does. Um, if you go into settings here, there's a strobe effect. Uh, you could turn that on and you can adjust the speed and it kind of comes in and out for you so you can see those differences. Pretty awesome, huh? <laughs> so you can be kind of drawing away and you can check. So just like I was doing here with the transparency, um, that's that strobe effect, which is so cool. Um, so I can kind of toggle this on and off and see differences. So look at that. Um, there is uh, right in here, um, there's that difference in the, the, the length of the hair that I somehow missed. Wasn't paying attention to that. I'm not sure how critical it was, but I think it worked out okay. But kind of toggling on and off helps you to see see those differences. And again, I mean, the, the, the ultimate goal is to create the drawing, right? And, um, and so if the drawing works, that's, that you're good to go. But it really helps you to kind of get in there and see those subtle differences. Like I said, sometimes when it's really close, it's hard to know what needs to be fixed. And that's something that we talk about a lot when I would teach drawing is that, uh, I, you know, I'd have students say, there's something wrong with this, but I can't see it. I don't know what it is. And so it's when, we, when we're teaching how to see and observe the world around us and translate it through drawing, using the drawing process as a way to better understand our world, uh, one of the other skills that um, can require development is to be able to then analyze the drawing itself, right? You know, we get, we get it's easy, we, not easy, we, but it's, it's possible to, you know, become a better observer and know all the tools for a drawing, but then, then sometimes identifying, well, how did I, where did I go wrong with those tools in the drawing itself can sometimes be tricky or what is off here? And so using tools um, in that way can be really helpful because then once you see it through the tool, then you, you might be able to see it more effectively on your own. So I really like this, this is the Coventry rag, nice soft look to it that I thought worked well for kind of the, the quality of light that we have written in here. So, um, so I think that is, that's about it. This is a tough one, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. I'm so glad we used this tool, and I might use it again for future drawings. Um, so uh, kind of keep that, um, keep that in mind. Again, I just wanted to kind of talk about that. It's something that we haven't really addressed um, thoroughly, but like, what do you, how do you, how do you move forward using tools, right? And, and hopefully, and not in a way that people feel guilty at all, like it's some sort of secret that you can't tell other people about. Um, but there's kind of an intention around it and you say, yeah, no, I use this. I need, you know, it's really helpful and it's helpful because of this. Um, we sometimes um, attribute, you know, the ability just to do it by hand as, as a skill that's particularly beneficial. And it can be really impressive to see, um, but it may not be for everybody, right? So um, again, you want to do what, what you need to to keep drawing. And that's the most important. What I'd hate to see is people not draw because they feel like they're somehow cheating or they're not doing it right or not good enough or something. Do what it, do what it takes to draw. And if you, if you can, just try to, try to identify, well, what, what is going to help me in the long run? So, uh, and, uh, so I'm just kind of darkening this a little bit. I felt like the bounce light on this side of the head was a little too strong. Um, and then I can kind of enhance that a little bit by erasing off a bit of light here, increase that contrast. Yeah, I kind of like that that balance up there a little bit more. So I'm, I'm happy with this value relationship up here. I feel like there's that, that sense of structure there. Happy with this. Um, I'm not sure I've ever find the features 100% as well as they could be, but I feel good enough for today. It's been a lot of fun. Um, remember, there's always got to be something. I, last thing I wanted is a is a drawing that I'm 100% happy with, right? I like I like that there's now there's more for me to kind of address in future drawings. So. Um, 
Mary C., I focus on how I feel during and after I draw. Some just exercises or quick gestural marks. I feel so relaxed, so I draw more. Then the more I draw, the more often one of the drawings is not so bad. That's perfect. I love it. Um, that's great. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, I, I totally agree. I feel the same way. Um, it should feel good to draw or make art. Not that it's going to happen all the time. I chastise myself sometimes when, I, when I'm, not, I'm still going forward and getting grumpy about it. And sometimes you just got to power through it because, you know, I, I, drawing can set me in the right mood and then sometimes in the right mood and I just need to express it through drawing. Um, and sometimes you just have to, sometimes you just have to, it's a, if it's your job and you got to get a drawing done, you just got to do it. You, know, you have to kind of set that, you know, set your feelings aside and say, hey, I got to get this done. Um, and so that's all good too. But um, it's best when you're feeling good about it and it all aligns. All right, I'm get, starting to get nitpicky here. So I think I'm gonna sign off. Uh, thank you all again for joining me. Oh, what do I have? I don't know if you can see this guy in the back. There's a fish. That's what we're gonna draw next week. So um, it's gonna be in charcoal on tone paper. Uh, a lot of fun. A challenging one again, but I think it's a little bit more forgiving than a portrait. So I'm so glad I got to use these tools and introduce them to you again. This is that DaVinci Eye app, so give that a shot. Um, it simulates what I was doing here using the transparency. Um, it, it, for, so for the purposes of this drawing exercise, I used, I used um, my OBS here to achieve that. So, um, oh, I saw something I can correct here. And hopefully it gives you a sense of how it can be used effectively. And there, again, there's so many tools that you're going to find your own way. And hopefully you, you learn how to push it in fun and creative ways too. So um, have fun with it. Um, have fun with these drawings. I hope to see them if you can post them on Drawing Together page. I posted that link at the top of the chat as well as in the description so you can share your work when you're done. I can't wait to see it. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, 